Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Tom. Uh, For those of you who don't know and for those of you who have joined us online, thanks for being here today. And uh, we pray that this time together will be a blessing for you and uh, an encouragement as well. And I want to share with you today a bit about someone that encouraged Lori and myself when we were early in ministry. We moved to Ottawa in 1994 to begin our first solo pastorate. And when we got there in this place called Nepean, Ontario, which is just like a suburb city of Ottawa, we did not know anyone. We knew no one in the community and we knew no one in the church. And so we were excited about starting this new life and uh, this new ministry opportunity, but we felt that loneliness or that aloneness. And early on in our ministry, this lady named Teresa Wood approached us. And she said that she wasn't much of an upfront person, but she loved to pray. And she said she would be praying for us regularly, and if we wanted to, we could pass on to her specific needs in our lives, and she would lift them up before the Lord. Well, we hardly knew Teresa, and it's a little bit intimidating saying or passing on your personal prayer request to someone you hardly know, but she soon uh, proved trustworthy and sincere, and it was obvious. And so I would pass on specific prayer requests that we had to Teresa, and she prayed for us. And we were very thankful for her because the first year in that ministry was one of the most difficult that we have had in all of our ministry lives. But Teresa prayed. In her life, uh, things had happened that deepened her walk with God. Hard things. Things like she was married, but her husband passed away at the age of 29. And so she was a young widow And when we arrived, she was also dealing with cancer. So she had just completed some cancer treatments and seemed to be coming through that. And then we made it through the first year of our ministry, and then her cancer returned. And yet, whenever we visited, even though she was suffering, and even though she was in pain and going through treatment, she would be positive and upbeat and joyful and would share things that she was praying about for us. But things got worse for her. She got weaker and weaker, and eventually she passed away. We only had her for just a year during our 11 years of ministry there, yet we were so thankful for the ministry that she offered for us. And we look forward to one day in heaven being able to see Teresa face to face and thanking her for the ministry that she did on our behalf. And whenever I think about Teresa, I think about her prayer life, which causes me to reflect on my prayer life. And I wonder today about your prayer life. I wonder how you would say your prayer life is going. As Christians, we know that prayer is part of the deal of being a Christian. It's, it's what we do. It's uh, a, a joy that we can come and and talk to God at any time about anything. But what might you be praying about these days? What do you pray about for others close to you? And if you only had a limited amount of time to pray each day, what do you think might be the most important things to pray about? And today, we're going to see one of the most important prayer requests we can make to God for our own lives and on behalf of the lives of others. And this prayer request could make a significant positive difference in our lives and the lives of those that we want to pray about. It's found in the letter to the Colossians that we started last week, And we're going to look at what to ask for from God, for others, and for ourselves that might bring great life change. And so I pray today that God will use something in this time together to inspire, 
our prayer lives and lead to life change that glorifies him. So would you please find Colossians 1 in your Bibles or on your devices, or it's on page six or 834 in the Bibles that are in front of you there. And we're going to be looking at verses 9 to 14, and this is the Apostle Paul who is writing to the Christians at Colossae. And he writes this in Colossians 1, verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So last week, in verses 3 to 8, we saw Paul inform the Colossians that he was thankful to God for them and that whenever he prayed for them, he would express thanks to God. Why? Because they were living authentic Christian lives. And we saw last week three marks of the authentic Christian life a person who is an authentic Christian has faith in Christ Jesus, they love others, and they look forward with hope to God's future blessings. And we also saw last week that they could live these authentic lives as we can live these authentic lives because of the power of God and the gospel flowing in and through us. So in verses 3 to 8, Paul tells them why he is thankful to God when he prays. But in verses 9 to 14, he talks about what he prays for the Colossians. And here we find the prayer request that we're going to focus on today. So what can we ask God for that will cause life change? And this comes directly from verse 9 in Colossians 1. We need to ask to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And if you want to pray something life-changing for your own life, ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And if you want to pray for positive life change in someone else's life, then ask God to fill them with the knowledge of his will. But what is the knowledge of God's will? When we hear the phrase God's will, we usually begin to think about what is God's will for my life? That's the natural thing that we want to think about. We want to have God's counsel and have God's direction for the decisions that we have to make, the choices we have to make, and the direction that we are looking to take in life. And certainly God can provide this. According to Psalm 32, 8, for example, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. And we see examples in the Bible of God giving people direction and sometimes specific direction, like the direction that he gave Noah to build the ark and gave dimensions for it. The direction he gave Moses to build the tabernacle. The direction that he gave Abraham to leave his family and to go to a land that he would show them. We see God giving direction, guidance to individuals throughout their lives and throughout the Bible. But here it seems that that is not the focus of what's being talked about. Here, it seems the knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding refers to this deep, steadfast understanding of God and his plan and purposes through Jesus. So the wisdom or the knowledge of God's will is a deep, steadfast understanding of God and his plan and purposes through Jesus. And some commentators 
try to explain it in different ways. One says the knowledge of God's will is more than simply how God wants people to behave. It is an understanding of God's whole saving purposes in Christ and thus, and thus a knowledge of God himself. Or another writes, what Paul has in mind is not some particular or special direction for one's life, but a deep abiding understanding of the revelation of Jesus Christ and all that he means for the universe. And it takes years of walking with God to grow in such understanding. It's like the knowledge that a couple married for 50 or 60 years gains of one another. They go through many stages and phases in life and they have a deep knowledge of one another. And this command or this prayer is similar to that. It is calling us to grow and to receive the knowledge of God's will for the universe and what he's doing in the world and what he's doing through Jesus. And we need this knowledge because God's will and the knowledge of his will is very different than the will and knowledge of the world. In Romans 12, verse 2, for example, Paul, the same author, writes this, Do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. So he's presenting a contrast there. Don't conform to the world's way of thinking and willing and acting. Instead, have your mind transformed so you can discern the will of God. So how might the knowledge of the will of God contrast with the world's knowledge? And I want to give you some examples here. Let's consider some questions and the different ways the world would answer the question and God would answer. So here's one question. Whose life is your life? And the world would say, well, that's pretty obvious. You own your life. It's your life. You do with it what you want. And so many people take their lives and, and seek to better themselves through education and through fitness and hard work and they want to earn a living and all those, those things. And others say, well, you know, the most important thing in life is for me to have a good time, so I want to live so I can uh, fund that that purpose in my life, whether it be uh, endless recreation or uh, endless partying, that's what I'm going to do. It's my life, and I get to do whatever I want with it. Whereas the knowledge of God's will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, would say, yes, your life is your life, but it is a gift from God. Every breath we take is a gift. Every day we live is a gift. God is the creator and giver of life. So someone who lives by the knowledge of God's will would ask, what does God want me to do with this life that he's given me? Or how can I glorify God with this life? How about this question, another one. Whose body is your body? And the world would answer, well, that's also a no-brainer. You own your body. You own your body have the right to do whatever you want with your body. No one has the right to tell you what you should do with your body. And the knowledge of God's will with spiritual wisdom and understanding says, yes, it is your body, but this also is a gift from God. And he actually purchased you and your body from slavery to sin through Jesus' blood on the cross. Jesus has given us an opportunity to be free from that which enslave, enslaves us. So since he purchased our bodies for our good, then we choose to honor God with our bodies. Or how about this question? Who's in control of the world? Well, the world might give de many different answers. Fate the most powerful leaders, the United Nations, 
No one. It's all random. It's all chance. Whereas the knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding will answer, the Lord God is sovereignly ruling over the universe and he's accomplishing his purposes and plans through all that's happening, even though we often don't see or understand how he's working. But we can find out about God's plan and purposes through his word from Genesis to Revelation. Or one more, why is there suffering and evil in the world? And the world might answer because of lack of education, lack of appropriate technology, lack of wealth distribution, lack of appropriate care for the planet, because some psychopath or sociopath gets in power. That's why there's evil. And those answers might be a little piece of the puzzle, but the knowledge of God's will says the fall of man brought sin into the world. That tarnished creation, so we now live in a fallen world where there is suffering and tears and death. And on top of that, some angels rebelled against God in heaven, and the chief rebel angel is Satan, and he and his forces wreak havoc and wage war against God and his people, and they simply want to destroy people. But through Christ, God is retaking territory and lives from Satan and from sin. And one day, God will restore the earth and call every hidden wrong to account and ultimately defeat Satan, sin, and death. And that's just four examples of the difference between the knowledge of God's will and the knowledge of the world. So when we ask God to fill us with the knowledge of his will, we're asking him to show us reality, to show us the way things really are, because by his very nature, God cannot lie. So he is not going to reveal to us something that's untrue, something that's deceptive, something that will lead us away from the way things really are. He is going to reveal to us reality. And then we can live in the light of that reality. And notice Paul prays, not for a spoonful of knowledge of God's will, but that the Colossians might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And that happens only by walking with God day after day, month after month, year after year, soaking in his word, living from the spirit, and living in community with other Christians who walk with us. So that's the big prayer request from this passage. And when we pray this, we're asking for something that can help in every area of our lives, and in every area of the lives of the people that we pray for. And this might be why Paul prayed this, because he knew that the Colossians needed the knowledge of God's will to navigate the Christian life in the pagan culture in which they found themselves. So that's the big prayer request. But notice the goal of this prayer is not just knowledge. The goal is life change. So verse 9 and verse 10 again. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So Paul and Timothy pray that the Colossians will be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that they will live God-pleasing lives. Why pray this prayer request? It's so that we can live God-pleasing lives. Why would anyone want to live a God-pleasing life? A couple reasons. Number one, God is for us. God knows what's best for us. God wants what's best for us. Jesus came so that we might have life and have it to the full. So when we live God-pleasing lives, we're tapping into this life that Jesus came to give us. But secondly, 
we also want to live God-pleasing lives because we owe God our lives. He gave us life. He gave his son to die for us. God has shown incredible grace and mercy to us. In fact, in Romans 12, 1, again by Paul, he writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, in view of all the things that God has done for you, in view of all the mercy that he has shown you, in view of all the gifts and opportunities that he has given you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So we ask for this prayer, not just to gain knowledge, but so that we and the others that we pray for can live God-pleasing lives. Well, what does a life that pleases God involve? And Paul goes on to explain some different pieces of this God-pleasing life. Number one is it bears fruit in every good work. Verse 10 to bear fruit includes doing good works that glorify God. It means to live in a way that honors God. And as we live by the Spirit, our lives begin to bear the fruits of the Spirit. So we see in our lives more love, joy, and peace. More patience, kindness, and goodness. More faithfulness gentleness and self-control and all of these fruits are found in the character of God himself and in Jesus when he walked on the earth so when we ask to be filled with the knowledge of God's will it includes being shaped into the likeness of Jesus God's will is for us to change and become more and more like Christ and hopefully you can look back on your life and see change in some of these areas of the fruit of the Spirit. And that is evidence of the Spirit's work in your life and your growth in the knowledge of God's will. What else does a life pleasing to God look like? Secondly, it increases in the knowledge of God. So we pray for the knowledge of God's will so that we increase in the knowledge of God. And gaining an understanding of God is part of a life pleasing to him. There's a lot of misinformation out there about God. Have you noticed? And people make statements or conclusions about God that are inaccurate, and then they live their lives according to those conclusions. I remember one time hearing someone talk about the passing of their grandmother, and they were very close to their grandmother. So obviously there was pain, and it hurt. Yet in a conversation a few months later, the topic of God came up. And they shared their conclusion about God. And it went something like this. If God loved me and our family, he would not have let my grandmother die. Now, I can appreciate the pain behind that statement but do you also see the incompleteness of such a view if God loved me he would not have let my grandma die well remember earlier we talked about living in a fallen world and because of the fall of man death and sin entered the world therefore death is an inevitable part of life in this world so when someone we love dies it does not mean god has stopped loving us we live in a fallen world god is with us in our pain god the father knows what it's like to lose a loved one as his own son died on the cross god has done something about death jesus conquered it through his own resurrection God sent him so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And God also comforts us in our losses. So such knowledge of God can contribute to a life pleasing to God as we look at the world through the eyes of God. 
What else does a life pleasing to God involve? Number three, strength. Strength with all power according to his glorious might. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. This is what Paul prays for them. This is what is an example or part of living a God-pleasing life. Now this one, of course, we all want, don't we? We all need strength from God to deal with life's challenges. Would anyone like strength to continue as a Christian when you see others around you giving up? Living a life pleasing to God is a very difficult calling. Yet God does not leave us on our own to live this out. He provides strength. And this is no ordinary strength. This is not a teaspoon of strength. It is strength with all power according to his glorious might. It means to be strengthened by God with the greatest strength imaginable. And when we talk of God's glory... We are talking about his weightiness, his heaviness, his overwhelming presence. It's like the glory of God that we saw throughout the Ezekiel study, if you were with us through the spring and the summer. And remember Ezekiel 1, the first vision that Ezekiel had of God in his chariot throne. And he's overwhelmed. And at the end of Ezekiel 1, verse 28, he says, such was the appearance of the glory of the Lord, the heaviness, the overwhelming presence of the Lord. And he fell on his face. And the same God with all of that power and all of that strength wants to give us strength as we seek to please him with our lives. Yet, when I hear that, I think, hmm, receiving strength empowered by God's glorious might must mean that I'm going to be like Superman. I'm going to be able to leap tall buildings, and I'm going to be able to overcome every problem in my life with Superman power. But notice where this strength is directed in verse 11. Being strengthened with all power for all endurance and patience with joy. So the fourth characteristic of the God-pleasing life is enduring difficult situations and having patience with difficult people. And that doesn't sound very glorious, does it? And yet maybe we have minimized how much strength it takes to live with endurance and patience. Endurance describes the ability to bear up or keep going under difficult circumstances. And patience involves long suffering with people. One commentator says, endurance is what faith, hope, and love bring to an apparently impossible situation. And patience is what is shown to an apparently impossible person. And we might think that the only time God shores up people with strength is when he has some massive culture-altering act to do. Like through Paul or through King David. But God sends his power according to his glorious might to enable us to endure difficult situations and difficult people. Screaming toddlers belligerent kids, unreasonable adults, unfair bosses, unsaved family members who give us grief. And remember how this prayer request has the potential to change our everyday lives? If you're going through a difficult time, God promises to give you strength to endure it. And if you have difficult people in your life, God promises to give you strength to bear with them to suffer along with them. Not that the, you permit abuse and mistreatment. God is also a God of justice and protection, yet God can give us patience while we deal with incredibly difficult people. And so we need to ask. We need to ask. 
And we started today by thinking about our prayer lives. And if we only have a limited time to pray, what might be some of the most important things to pray about? And we learned that asking God to fill us with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding can lead to life change in us and in those around us. And this life change shows up in a, as a life pleasing to God, which bears fruit in every good work, which increases in the knowledge of God, which gains strength for enduring difficult situations and showing patience with difficult people. So I want to invite you to pray this prayer today. And if you have a bulletin, I've written this prayer out so you can take it with you today and pray it again and again and again. God, will you please fill me with the knowledge of your will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that I, we, can live in a way that honors and pleases you. So I want to invite you to pray that for yourself in a moment. And then I want to invite you to pray it for other people that God brings to mind that need this in their lives. Okay? And so we're going to go to prayer, and I'm going to give you some time to pray, and then I'll close our time together. And so we come to you now, O oh God, and we have heard your word, and we have seen what Paul prayed for the Colossians. We see the wisdom of this prayer. We see the immeasurable, immeasurable possibility of this prayer in bringing into our lives that which we need, the knowledge of your will. And so now we pray this for ourselves and for those around us. And Lord God, we are immersed in the world's wisdom, in the world's ways. It bombards us through the lips of others, through the things that we see on our phones or our tablets or our TV screens, through what we hear sometimes in classrooms or at work, or on the bus, or at a social gathering. We need the knowledge of your will. Not to be arrogant or judgmental, but to walk in a way like Jesus walked. And so we ask for that in our lives, Lord. And you know each person here, and you know what specifically we need what area of knowledge of your will we need to grow in, we need to be made aware of today. So open our eyes to that, we pray. And for all the others who are being thought about and prayed for right now, you know what knowledge of your will they need. Will you unveil their eyes to see, to hear, to respond to what you have to say? Thank you, O oh God, for making the knowledge of your will available and open to us. And we pray this in your powerful name. Amen.